Hello and welcome. I want to welcome you all this evening for our lecture. It's a part of the Theological Commons. And the Theological Commons is a means through which the school shares intellectual resources with the church and the world through dialogue with the broader community. We offer events, learning resources, continuing conversation. And the Theological Commons promotes the sharing of knowledge and experience between students, faculty, clergy, and the public for the benefit of all those, all participants and those they serve. Tonight's lecturer is uh, Dr. Ray Person, Raymond F. Person, from Ohio Northern University, where he's a professor of religion and uh, philosophy. And he's the author of eight books, including Empirical Models, Challenging Biblical Criticism, recently out as a collection of essays from the SBL Press. And from Conversation to Oral Tradition, A Simplest Systematics for Oral Traditions, out from Routledge. But more importantly, scholarship stuff's good. But more importantly, Ray is the uh, chief farmer of about 20 acres outside of Bluffton, where he's run a CSA with 17 families, um, where the CSA is based on the gift of labor to make sure the farm works and functions incredibly well. He runs a holistic farm where they have pigs, goats, goats, Ducks and chickens. You have a cow? No, no, no cows. No cows. But uh, the understanding of, of having a farm where the entire system works together to build the soils, to build uh, fertility for, for all of that, and, and the kind of model that we're looking towards here um, in the future. Ray's been a friend for quite a few years. I think within my first year here, we somehow got introduced, had several conversations found out a number of shared passions, including the fact that uh, food and the gathering of people around food is probably one of the best ways to build community and think about uh, changing the world in which we live. I'm looking forward to the conversation tonight, as, uh, as I look forward to many conversations, both at his farm and in his office. Thank you so much, Ray. It's, it's good to be here. There's been a variety of relationships over the years uh, between uh, MTSO and, and ONU and, and between First Mennonite Church in Bluffton where I attend and MTSO. So uh, it's, it's good to, to see familiar faces and, and to be here with you tonight. The most significant insight in the academic study of religion in the last 100 years has come from the various contextual theologies, the earliest being feminist theology and Latin American liberation theology, but now including a whole host of theologies, Minjung theology in Korea, Dalit theology in India, womanist theology in the African American community, queer theology, and many others. This insight is that interpretations are not simply based on texts themselves, but are influenced by the interpreter's social location. Let re me repeat this. Interpretations are not simply based on the text themselves, but are influenced by the interpreter's social location. This insight seems so obvious to many of us now. Not all of us, but many of us. Of course, those who are victims of racism will have better insights into how the Bible has been used to support racist structures. And women will have better insights into how the Bible has been used to support androcentric structures. Furthermore, those who are LGBTQ will have better insights into how the Bible has been used to support heterosexism. And when we take post-colonial theory seriously, we know that one social location is a complex blend of issues concerning things like gender, race, class, and sexual orientation, so that all of us need to pay close attention not only to our own social location when we interpret the Bible, but we also need to listen carefully to those many competing voices from those who in some way are the other to us as we interpret the text from their social location. Only then can we say that we have truly struggled with what the living God is trying to say to us through the biblical text. Most recently, this insight is being a, a, applied to the greatest problem facing our generation and future generations, 
That is the environmental crisis that we've created for ourselves, most obviously in the form of global climate change and its effects on the non-human members of the Earth community. That is the very existence of life as we know it. In other words, we need to carefully understand how our location within the Earth community has prevented us from seeing clearly how our own actions negatively impact nature in ways that is detrimental for all members of the Earth community, including ourselves. In order to do that, we need to listen to the voices of the non-human members of the Earth community to learn from them how human actions are affecting their very existence. We need to overcome what Forrest Klingerman has identified as a modern plague threatening our very existence, what he calls environmental amnesia. Environmental amnesia is that inappropriate forgetting that renders our experience of nature two-dimensional, ahistorical, individualistic, and motivated by instrumental use. This environmental amnesia is related to what Richard Love has called a natural deficit disorder, as well as to how much time most of us spend in what Mark Auge calls non-places, such as shopping malls and airports. The obvious cure for environmental amnesia, then, is leaving behind such non-places to spend more time closer to nature, and although this is probably best done spending a lot of time in wilderness, we can also see how the various back to nature and back to the land movements, including urban farming, can help cure us of environmental amnesia. Our own environmental identities, therefore, are significantly influenced by how rich our experience of nature is. Those of us who grew up in and have lived our whole life in the concrete jungle suffer more environmental amnesia than those of us who lived our entire life on a homestead next to a nature preserve. At this point, I think it is helpful for me to be self-revealing about my own environmental identity based on the homes I have lived in and other significant places in my life. I grew up in a white, working-class neighborhood in Memphis, Tennessee during the 60s and 70s, where my experience of nature close to home was limited primarily to the front and backyards in the neighborhood, including a big oak tree in my backyard where we had a tree house, the various family pets we had, and a small vegetable garden and apple tree in our own backyard. I was fortunate that my parents encouraged me to participate in Boy Scouts in the church youth group so that I spent many weekends and some weeks at Camp Courier and Camp Kayakima with the Boy Scouts and Bethany Hills Camp with the youth group. My father took me hunting and fishing and most of our family vacations were spent in state parks in our pop-up camper or at church camp. Because of this, I had a much richer experience of nature than some other kids who lived in our neighborhood that not only included spending time in the woods, lakes, creeks, and fields in these various places, but also some formal instruction in identifying trees, wildlife, and soil types. When I left home, I continued to spend free time in outdoor sports, such as canoeing and hiking. And after I married, Elizabeth uh, and I rented our first house. I had a small vegetable garden in the backyard. In 2003, Elizabeth and I moved to the farm where we currently live. Our home is a 20-acre organic farm that is now run by a cooperative of 17 families. Although Elizabeth and I are the only ones who live on the farm, very few days pass when there's not someone else working on the farm. We have a large vegetable garden, a small orchard, and livestock, including sheep, goats, pigs, and chickens, the two dogs, Skillet and Daisy, and the three cats, Earl, Duke, and Duchess, are also important members of the farm, controlling predators and rodents. I knew at the time when we moved to the farm that my experience on the farm would affect my biblical scholarship in some way, but I really didn't know how. Now I can look back and see how living on a farm has influenced my biblical scholarship, and that is what I want to spend the rest of my time doing tonight. 
Carol Myers has written extensively on the typical agrarian household in ancient Israel and has concluded that the identity of any family unit was inseparable from its land, which was the material basis of its survival. <laughs> she reached this insight about Israelite agrarian households from careful archaeological and ethnographic studies. Her insight is obviously consistent with Klingerman's understanding of environmental identity, that is, ancient Israelite environmental identity was connected to the family's land and all of the members of the earth community that lived on that land. As someone who now has some experience on a farm with sheep and goats, I think I now have some additional insights into what Myers has concluded, that is, my social location on a farm and the resulting changes to my environmental identity have opened up new possible possibilities for me as a biblical scholar to see new meanings in the book of Deuteronomy. In my reflections, I will begin with observations about what I have learned from the farm community concerning the six eco-justice principles of the Earth Bible Project, a project that I have participated in, most clearly demonstrated in my Deuteronomy commentary. I will then discuss how my experience on the farm had some direct influence on my writing the commentary. The Earth Bible Project is an attempt to overcome any anthropocentric bias in the biblical text and in the history of the interpretation of the biblical text as the contribution of biblical scholars to an accurate diagnosis of the problems that have influenced our creation of the current ecological crises with the possibility of uncovering biblical insights that may contribute to the solutions. In partnership with ecologists, the Earth Bible team developed six eco-justice principles as follows. The principle of intrinsic worth. The universe, Earth, and all its components have intrinsic worth and value. The principle of interconnectedness. Earth is a community of interconnected living things that are mutually dependent on each other for life and survival. The principle of voice. Earth is a subject capable of raising its voice in celebration and against injustice. The principle of purpose. The universe, Earth, and all its components are part of a dynamic cosmic design within which each piece has a place in the overall design of that, the goal of that design. The principle of mutual custodianship. Earth is a balanced and diverse domain where responsible custodians can function as partners with, rather than rulers over, Earth to sustain its balance in a diverse Earth community. And the principle of resistance. Earth and its components not only suffer from human injustices, but actively resist them in the struggle for justice. These principles guide our interpretation of the biblical text as a way of helping us hear the voices of the non-human members of the Earth community. And I want to reflect on how my experience as a farmer has strengthened my understanding of the truth of these principles but I'll only discuss two of the principles for the sake of time, the principle of interconnectedness and the principle of voice. When we first moved from town to the farm, as we somewhat expected, we had to put up with some more insects, most annoyingly flies. In our first year, we had a small flock of free-range chickens, but in the second year, I bought the first goats. I assumed that with goats and their manure, we would have more flies to deal with than this, that second summer, but I was surprised that the opposite was the case. This required me to rethink what was happening on the farm, because I thought I understood the interconnections between goats, manure, and flies. But I, my understanding was incomplete. Now I know that the ecology of the farm was more complex than I originally understood. When I opened up the barn for the first time for the goats to move in, I also unintentionally invited in a small family of barn swallows. So although the manure was fertile ground for flies to breed in, the barn swallows spent all day flying around the pasture eating flying insects. 
I also didn't consider that the chickens would spend some of the day scratching in the manure looking for the fly larva for food. In other words, the introduction of goats to the farm did not increase the fly problem because the uninvited but nevertheless very welcomed barn swallows and the farm chickens together help with the process of controlling the flies on the farm. Of course, the flies still live on the farm and they still have their place in the ecology, but they're not as big of a problem in the house as I had anticipated because I did not fully understand the principle of interconnectedness in relationship to this one issue. The clearest example of a non-human on our farm who knows how to communicate with me is Skillet. Our 14-year-old Vizsla, who because of his advanced age is the only non-human on the farm we allow in the house with us. Anyone who has had a pet for a long time knows this, and our companion animals are probably one of the best ways that we remain connected to non-human members of the Earth community on any kind of a regular basis. They really become part of the family, and we grieve at their deaths. But since this is something many of you can already relate to, I want to talk more about Skillet's relationship with the other non-humans in the farm community, because it is clear to me that he communicates well with the other non-human animals on the farm, whether they are the good guys he is protecting or the bad guys he is chasing off and occasionally killing. The last four springs, we have had a pair of hawks nesting in a tree along the ditch on the neighbor's farm on the other side of the pasture. Hawks will occasionally kill a chicken. It's only natural, but it is something I hope to prevent. When you have free-range chickens, it's important to have some roosters in the flock. The hens spend so much time foraging for food because they need more nutrition to produce eggs. Therefore, the rooster's job is to be the sentries, looking out for any approaching predators. The roosters have different crows. A crow for just announcing that he's here and this is his flock. A crow for warning the flock of a flying enemy and a crow for warning the flock of a land-based enemy. Although I cannot tell the difference between these crows, the hens obviously can. Sometimes when I hear a crow, the hens scatter to get under the nearest tree or bush because they have been warned of a coming bird of prey. So even though I don't understand the rooster's crows, I know that there must be a difference because the hens act differently and under the right circumstances. What is so amazing is that Skillet has figured out the different crows as well. At least he knows when the rooster is warning of a flying predator. I have seen Skillet jump up from his lane around when the rooster crows and run in the direction of the rooster until he sees the hawk in the sky to chase him. <coughs> then Skillet will bark <coughs> and chase the hawk off the farm. Once the hawk is at a safe distance, then Skillet can return to relaxing but often with the eye in the direction of where the hawk went. And eventually the hens continue to forage while the roosters keep a lookout. What is so important about this example is that it demonstrates how communication can occur across species lines. Skillet has clearly learned the rooster's language and the hawks have learned Skillet's warning to leave the chickens alone. As a result, I lose only two or three chickens a year to hawks usually in the late summer when the hawks have effectively eliminated most of the rodents nearby that they can easily catch and are forced to take greater risk. Although they kill a couple of chickens each year, they do not successfully eat the chickens because they cannot carry them off and Skillet and Daisy will chase them off the carcass before they have a chance to eat it. Hopefully Daisy, our three-year-old, Green Walker Coonhound will learn this skill from Skillet. Furthermore, if we humans can live in closer proximity to other members of the Earth community, both domestic and wild, maybe we too can learn to listen more carefully to the voices of the Earth community. At least I think Skillet and the other animals on the farm have taught me that that's possible. In the last 150 years, the American population has shifted dramatically from rural areas to urban areas. 
And this is one explanation of our growing environmental amnesia. That is, we have removed ourselves from nature to some degree. I contend that this same kind of displacement occurred in the ancient world in the ancient Near East, where some of the earliest urban societies developed so that the ancient urban elites also experienced some degree of environmental amnesia. Urban areas create environmental amnesia because they set up false dichotomies between nature and culture. And the urban culture was, has what Philip Davies has referred to as a parasitic relationship with the surrounding rural area. The environmental historian Jared Diamond refers to urban areas as kleptocracies and that they require a flow of agricultural products and raw materials, and therefore wealth in general, from rural areas to the cities. Furthermore, urbanization in the ancient Near East is closely related to the monarchy and state formation, furthering the parasitic relationship in which the wealthy royals depend on the agrarian households for their lavish lifestyles. According to 1 Kings 4, Solomon required the following every day to feed the royal bureaucracy. 30 cores of flour, 60 cores of meal, 10 fattened cattle, 20 pasture-fed cattle, and 100 sheep and goats, besides deer, gazelle, roebucks, and fattened fowl. All of which was provided by his subjects. Of course, not every Israelite city in every time and place had a Solomon whose bureaucracy had such an appetite, and this most certainly may be an exaggerated accounting. But I find it remarkable that this is recorded in such a way that it does not appear to be a burden to those who actually raise the livestock and crops. Urbanization became possible with the invention of metal. But the increased demand for metal objects and ceramics required huge amounts of wood and charcoal for fuel, leading to deforestation and the need to import wood from further and further away from the city. To give you some idea of the ecological cost of metal, I want to use the example of copper in ancient Sumer as described by Donald Hughes, an environmental historian. The mining of copper ore created open pits and tunnels in the countryside, rendering that land unusable for farming. Furthermore, 15 to 25 tons of charcoal was necessary to convert the raw ore into one ton of copper. And the copper compounds themselves were poisonous, polluting the workplace and any place the waste might be disposed nearby the city. Because of this parasitic relationship between cities and their rural surroundings, urbanization and the related centralization had an adverse effect on agrarian households. First, some nearby agrarian households were taken over for the purpose of city-related functions. Second, those agrarian households that continued were required to provide food and other raw materials for the city bureaucracy in the form of taxes so that the agrarian households were no longer involved simply in subsistence farming, but had to somehow participate in a different economic model, a tributary mode of production, requiring them to use their land to produce goods for the royal bureaucracy in the city. I locate the Deuteronomic school. Those scribes that produced and transmitted the Deuteronomic history, including the book of Deuteronomy, in urban settings in ancient Israel. I trace the roots of the Deuteronomic school to the scribes who were part of the pre-monarchic central bureaucracy in Jerusalem and were then forced into exile in Babylon. The Deuteronomic school emerged from these scribal groups in the Babylonian exile, where even in exile, they continued to function as part of the central bureaucracy in an urban area under Babylonian control. Later, under the Persians, the Deuteronomic school returned to Jerusalem as part of the urban elite associated with the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the temple and the reconstitution of the temple cult. Thus, the book of Deuteronomy reflects the environmental identity of the Deuteronomic school, the urban literati who were removed from the daily task of the agrarian households 
that existed in a variety of ecological niches throughout Israel. It is because of the environmental amnesia of the Deuteronomic scribes that they could perpetuate dichotomies that would not have been easily accepted by those Israelites living in agrarian households. Dichotomies such as land versus wilderness, Israel versus the nations, and clean versus unclean animals. Now I want to explore with you the dichotomy of land versus wilderness. In Deuteronomy, land refers to habitable and hospitable land that God has given to humans. In fact, the land is not only habitable, but inhabited. The land of Moab, the land of the Canaanites, the land of Egypt, the land of the Rephaim, King Sion, the Amorite, the Peshbon and his land, and so forth. That is, land is identified in relationship to its human inhabitants. God parcels out land to humans. When the Most High apportioned the nations, when he divided humankind, he fixed the boundaries of the people according to the number of the gods. These decisions are not permanent. God can choose to dispossess some in order to give land to others. And this not only applies on behalf of the people of Israel. God dispossessed the Horim so that the descendants of Esau had land and the Rephaim so that the Ammonites had land. Of course, the central displacement was God's dispossessing the Hittites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, the seven nations of their land so that the people of Israel would have a good land. Although God has given other people's hospitable land as their home, the phrase, the good land, is reserved for the land God swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For the Lord your God is bringing you to a good land, a land with flowing streams, with springs and underground waters welling up in valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land where you may eat bread without scarcity, where you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and from whose hills you may mine copper. You shall eat your fill and bless the Lord your God for the good, of, for the good land that he has given you. In contrast, the wilderness is inhospitable to humans and as such is uninhabited. The space between Horeb and the land of the Amorites is described as that great and terrible wilderness. When Moses sings of their history, he describes the wilderness as a land of wilderness, a howling desert waste, where one would normally experience wasting hunger, burning consumption, bitter pestilence where one must avoid the teeth of beast and the venom of things crawling in the dust. The good land and the wilderness are theological constructs that are defined in opposition to each other. At first glance, this opposition appears to be primarily topographical. The good land is in the land of Canaan and the wilderness is beyond the Jordan. However, a closer look at the text clearly indicates that the dichotomy is really theological. When the people wandered in the wilderness, they lacked nothing for God was with them, as if they were living in a good land. Despite the wilderness typically being a God-forsaken place, the people of Israel survived their wilderness experience because of God's unusual mercy and promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When the people moved out of the wilderness into the good land, they must reflect on what they learned in the wilderness and obey God's law that was given to them there. If they disobeyed, they would find themselves in the wilderness again, even if it required God's changing the good land into wilderness. Obedience to the law brings certain blessings. If you will only listen to the voice of the Lord your God, blessed shall you be in town and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall you be, shall be the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your ground. 
the fruit of your animals, both the increase of your cattle and the issue of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be in your coming, and blessed shall you be in your going. Because God will so richly bless those who obey the law, there are special laws that relate to these blessings. In recognition of the bounty coming from God, the people of Israel must present their first fruits as thanksgiving offerings to God. Also, the bounteous harvest is so great that a portion must be left for the alien, the orphan, and the widow to glean. Thus, the good land can be a blessing from God for many. The law requires that the good land be protected from human defilement. The latrine must be outside the camp. That is, the location is symbolically not in the good land. Rather, it is out of sight in the wilderness. Those who commit evil acts must also be purged because they threaten the good land. This purging refers to capital punishment that must be carried out outside the city gates. Once again, symbolically the guilty are removed from the good land and killed in the wilderness where their blood and corpses cannot pollute the good land. But the boundaries between the good land and the wilderness shift again in the case of an unknown homicide in open country. The blood guilt that has polluted the good land must be satisfied and the elders of the nearest town must sacrifice a heifer for this purpose. The law concerning how the Israelites relate to those of other lands is also influenced by this dichotomy. Although the law forbids charging interest to an Israelite, interest can be charged to a foreigner. That is someone who does not belong in the good land because he should be elsewhere in his own land. The law concerning war differs for those enemies who live outside the good land and those unclean peoples who must be annihilated from the good land. This review has demonstrated how the boundaries between the good land and the wilderness shift and how the boundaries are topographical and theological. The good land can be understood as the entire promised land that must be taken from the other peoples including the open country, as well as the towns and cities. God blesses the entire land of Israel so that the bounteous harvest provides plenty for all, including the poorest. And with this plenty, the people give of their first fruits to God. However, the good land can also be understood as being within the town walls, so that those defiling acts, for example, defecation and capital punishment, can occur in the nearby wilderness, thereby not requiring a major journey out of the country. Therefore, the theological wilderness can be found within the topographical good land when such practicality is necessary, but is also outside the topographical good land, that is, beyond the Jordan. In the natural history of the Bible, Daniel Hillel discusses five principal ecological domains. The rain-fed, relatively humid domain, the pastoral, semi-arid domain, the rivering domain, the maritime, coastal domain, and the desert domain, all of which existed in ancient Israel. Hillel notes that there are no sharp lines that one can draw between these different domains, and that Wherever one might draw the lines, over time the lines might change due to shifts in climate. The theological construction of a good land in Deuteronomy collapses these various ecological domains into only two, land and wilderness. The desert domain is empty wilderness, complete with its theological denial of those human cultures that developed ways of surviving in this ecological domain. The other four ecological domains are collapsed into one, that is, habitable land, and are treated as the same in the legal constructions, once again denying the knowledge of the various human cultures that develop different ways of living in these various ecological domains. Thus, this theological construction ignores the wealth of human experience 
in living closely with the land in its diversity in order to construct one notion of a good land. Now I want to use the dichotomy of clean versus unclean animals to demonstrate how the urban elite's environmental amnesia as expressed in the collapsing of the various ecological domains into only one category of land did not make sense within the life of the agrarian households. For a long time, we have assumed that one of the best cultural markers in the material culture between Israelites and other ethnic peoples might be the presence or lack thereof of pig bones. And this assumption is based on the legal definitions of clean and unclean animals found in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. However, recent archaeologists have noted that pig husbandry in the ancient Near East had started its decline before the beginning of ancient Israel, primarily due to the aridization of the area. That is, in contrast to sheep and goats, pigs required a better source of water. Therefore, during dry periods, Israelite farmers would have naturally shifted their farming strategies away from raising pigs to raising sheep and goats for meat. And this apparently occurred throughout the ancient Near East prior to the formation of Israel. Nevertheless, archaeological evidence demonstrates that although pig husbandry declined significantly, it was not completely eliminated, even within Israel's borders. This is most likely due to local environmental factors. On those household lands on which water was more plentiful, the family household was more likely to raise pigs because pigs produced larger litters of young and, uh, and more often uh, than sheep and goats. On those household lands on which water was more scarce, the family household was more likely to abandon pig production and depend more on sheep and goats. What pigs eat in comparison to sheep and goats also has a bearing on this decision. Although pigs will graze on grass, Sheep and goats will eat a larger variety of plants, and when they stand on their hind legs, can reach high off the ground to eat leaves from trees and bushes. Therefore, arid periods would also have a negative impact on the plants available for the livestock to forage, especially the plants preferred by pigs. Although I first learned this from reading some zooarchaeological studies of the ancient Mediterranean basin. I also had first-hand knowledge of the different requirements of pigs on the one hand and sheep and goats on the other because I've raised these animals myself. As a way of further reflecting on how my knowledge as a farmer made a difference in my interpretation of Deuteronomy, I want to contrast my interpretation of Deuteronomy 14, 3 through 20 concerning unclean and clean distinction of animals with that of Walter Houston. In his 1993 monograph, Purity and Monotheism, Houston wrote the following. The primary distinction is between domestic animals and wild ones. Domestic ones are within the community in the limit, limited sense in which this can be true for non-human creatures. And to some extent, people are able to identify themselves with them. They are tame and submissive. Their docility concern, confirms human power over the animal world and their diet is acceptably pure. Wild creatures refuse the dominion of humankind. They tend to be violent and dangerous, and their diet typically leads to, tends to include waste matter and blood. There are a couple of problems with Houston's conclusion. First, the distinction between domesticated and wild may have referred more simply to how the domesticated animals were raised than to any necessary biological difference between domesticated and wild animals of that species. In other words, even though oxen, sheep, and goats had been domesticated so that they had become part of the family household, this does not necessarily mean that the domestic ox, sheep, and goats were considered that different from the wild ox, sheep, and goats. In fact, zoo archaeologists are quick to acknowledge the difficulty in distinguishing between wild and domesticated individuals of these species from bones. 
Also in her survey of art from the Middle Bronze Age to the Persian period, Annie Colbert noted that domesticated and wild species were often depicted together in art from Syro-Palestine, concluding as follows. The combination of wild and domestic species in such groupings further suggests that the wild domestic distinction is no more relevant for sheep and goats than it is for cattle. Furthermore, we know that even in rabbinic times, there was some debate about whether or not the aurochs or ox was a domesticated or wild animal. A quote from the rabbinic literature, a wild ox is a kind of domesticated animal. And then as typical, another rabbi says, a kind of wild animal. Thus, even though some species was dom were domesticated and others were not, this does not necessarily mean that those species that were domesticated in ancient Israel were understood as significantly different from their undomesticated kin. Secondly, I question Houston's interpretation of domesticated livestock as tame, submissive, and docile because of human power over the animal world. I strongly suspect that the modern breeds I raise are tamer than those of ancient Israel. Nevertheless, my livestock have taught me a degree of humility because when they do not want to cooperate with my directions, it is quite difficult to demand that they do what I want. Physically forcing an adult sheep, goat, or pig to do one's bidding is extremely difficult and certainly not a one-person job. Both my ram and my boar weigh about 300 pounds, more than I. They also have a lower center of gravity held up by four strong legs. So whenever I want them to do something, it can be a real struggle. However, if you work with an animal or a group of animals for a long time, you can develop a relationship with them so that they will sometimes do what you want them to do, but they still have minds of their own. This training does not, in my opinion, confirm my power over the animal world. Rather, it develops a mutually beneficial relationship between me and my animals. However, there nevertheless are times when they do not want to cooperate in this relationship in the way that I want to define the relationship even if I'm doing something that is ultimately for their benefit, such as trimming hooves. For example, one day my ram destroyed a section of the exterior wall of the barn by butting it with his head because he decided it was time to breed the ewes before I thought it best. <laughs> Similarly, the boar chewed through an oak one by six one day in his attempt to get to the sows. Admittedly, since I do not show my animals at county fairs, I spend much less time training my livestock than some. But I would not necessarily conclude that those who show prize-winning livestock at county fairs have more submissive animals, which they have more successfully dominated. Rather, they have developed a stronger, closer relationship with the animals for their mutual benefit. The animal on my farm that is the most tame you've already met is Skillet, the red, the, the, the Vizla, who also has the most freedom to come and go as he wishes. For example, he's the only non-human animal allowed in the house. Because of his tameness, has not come from specific training, but from his finding his place on the farm and in the family. Furthermore, I recognize those times when he has made up his mind about something and there's no turning him from it. For example, when he is chasing a hawk or an other predator. It is in those moments that I'm reminded that I have little power over him that he does not somehow grant to me in much the same way that his ancient, ancient wolf ancestors granted authority to the alpha pair in the pack. Before turning to another topic, let me close these reflections on clean and unclean animals with the following remarks from Mark Beckoff, a field biologist. Beckoff's comments imply a similar criticism of how Houston described non-human animals. 
Humans are part of nature. We do not stand above or to the side of other beings or natural processes. There is no duality, no them and us. If we try to separate our reality from that of other nature and earth, a division results that causes much discontent and discord, for it is so very unnatural. I find it unsettling, very relaxing, to situate myself in nature and to sense and experience the magic and wonderment of allowing myself to be there, living with all the contradictions in which we are immersed and with which we are surrounded makes life difficult for all of us. But these challenges are enriching and will make for a better future. We need animals more than ever because they have be we have become alienated and estranged from other nature. Animals are a way of knowing and feeling and are sources of wisdom. We have allowed this knowledge to be pushed aside and to erode as we consume animals and earth at unprecedented rates with unanticipated negative consequences. Beckhoff has captured why we modern Westerners need animals to help teach us that we cannot have dominion over other nature. And like the lessons my dog Skillet has taught me, many of us have learned things about other nature from our companion animals. These are the also lessons that the Deuteronomic school needed to overcome their environmental amnesia, but lessons that I suspect the rural residents of ancient Israel knew far better than the Deuteronomic school knew and that I know even though my life on the farm has probably given me a much better understanding of the truth of Beckhoff's observation than that of the average American. Thus far, I have focused on ways that the urban elite that wrote Deuteronomy may have suffered more environmental amnesia than those who lived in the typical agrarian households. But I have also suggested that even these ancient elites may have had less environmental amnesia or at least a different form of environmental amnesia than most of us today. Now I want to shift to how the laws concerning Sabbath rest may have been an attempt by the Deuteronomic school to overcome some ancient forms of environmental amnesia that they might have been aware of, and how the idea of Sabbath rest can continue to challenge us as we explore ways of treating ourselves for environmental amnesia within the context of the earth community in which we live. The policies of the Deuteronomic school for in the increasing centralization of power in Jerusalem contributed to their environmental amnesia. Jerusalem as the capital city exacerbated the parasitic relationship of cities to their surrounding countryside by having a greater number of religious and political specialists than other ancient Israelite cities thereby requiring a greater level of support by the surrounding agrarian households. However, any urban area influenced the rural society because of its parasitic relationship. The increasing tax burdens on the traditional family household that practiced a subsistence strategy led to a system that created large landowners and tenant farming. Norman Gottwald described this as follows. The tributary mode of production was dominated by a small elite and their bureaucratic servants who lived on the agricultural and pastoral surplus of a vast peasant majority. This surplus was extracted by casually connected and mutually reinforcing cycles of taxation and debt. Even the urban literati seem to be somewhat aware of the excesses of this system. At least they attempted to address such excesses in the laws concerning Sabbath, the Sabbath year, and the Jubilee year. The Sabbath laws are expressed primarily to the large landowners who had various laborers working under them. Six days you shall labor and do all your work but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son, or your daughter, 
your male slave or your female slave, your ox or your donkey, or any of your animals, or the alien who is within your gates, so that your male slave and your female slave may rest just like you. The typical agrarian household practicing subsistence farming would not have included such a large workforce, including slaves and resident aliens. Thus, the you that is explicit in the law is the large landowner, who can more easily find rest. Thus, the law is written so as to provide rest for the others, just like the large landowner for one day each week. As stated by Richard Lowry, the Sabbath is meant to revitalize the most vulnerable workers in the household economy, the slave, the resident alien, and first of all, the farm animals. The motivation for the Sabbath, according to Deuteronomy, is to quote, remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out from there. Ross and Gloria Kinsler described the purpose as follows. The Sabbath day was intended to break the cycle of daily work, always in danger of de degeneration into exploitation or drudgery, to offer rest and restoration for humans and animals alike, and to recall the divine purpose of liberation from slavery for building an alternative social possibility in which all would have enough and none would have more than enough. The primary purpose of the Sabbath was not related to centralized worship, but the cessation of work promoting rest. Neither slaves, nor aliens, nor animals would be interested in Israel's religious practices. Furthermore, only priests have to carry out the extra religious activities on the Sabbath. This rationale behind the Sabbath laws is extended in the laws concerning the Sabbath year. At the end of every seven years, you shall make a remission, and this is the manner of the remission. Every creditor shall release the loan into his hand that he, ho that he holds against his neighbor. If there is among you a needy person, do not harden your heart and do not shut your hand against your needy brother. Rather, you must surely find your hand, open your hand to him and willingly lend to him enough to meet the need, whatever he needs. Give generously to him and do not think evil in your heart when you give to him. For because of this thing, the Lord your God will bless you in all your efforts and in all that you undertake with your hand. For there will never cease to be the needy in the land. Therefore I command you, open widely your hand to your brother, to the poor, to the needy, in your land. If your brother, whether a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you, you, he shall serve you six years, and in the seventh year you shall set him free. When you set him free, do not send him away empty-handed. Provide liberally to him from your flock and from your threshing floor and from your wine vat, from that which the Lord your God has blessed you give to him. Remember that you were in the land of Egypt and that the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this word today. Extending the focus of the Sabbath on those who suffered the most in what Gottwald called the tributary mode of production, Deuteronomy 15, 1 through 8 addresses the remission of debts and the release of slaves which are clearly interrelated since many became slaves because of debts they could not repay. Just as Sabbath rest comes every seven days, the remission of debts should occur every seven years, and slaves should be released after six years of service. I probably should first state that some degree of environmental amnesia is also evident in the legal material concerning the Sabbath and the Sabbath year. Although the Sabbath laws apply to non-human animals, it is nevertheless limited to livestock, most of whom would have been, quote, clean animals. The Sabbath year in Deuteronomy does not include non-humans at all, 
in contrast to the inclusion of the land in Leviticus. And in fact, since it only applies to Israelites, it excludes most humans. Furthermore, the remission of debts in the Sabbath year laws excludes commercial loans with foreigners, thus benefiting the urban elite of ancient Israel. Thus, it seems that the laws concerning Sabbath and the Sabbath year are written in such a way as to reinforce some of the text dichotomies that are the result of environmental amnesia. However, I think that the Sabbath and Sabbath year laws are also to some extent attempts to overcoming some of the environmental amnesia that the ancient Israelites identified within themselves. At least that is implied in the motivation given for the Sabbath year. Remember that you were in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. If environmental amnesia is the inability to remember where and who we are, and one of its causes is the lack of communal participation in the natural world, then commandments to remember could be part of the treatment. If environmental amnesia is an inappropriate forgetting that renders our experience of nature two-dimensional, ahistorical, individualistic, and motivated by instrumental use, then the solution must include strategies to remember our places in natural and cultural history. Certainly the explicitly stated motivations for the Sabbath and Sabbath year laws to remember were attempts to move the ancient Israelites in the right direction towards a partial solution. Earlier I referred to Klingerman's discussion of the centrality of home and our environmental identity as well as the homelessness that we moderns face. Some recent discussions of Sabbath, Sabbath year, and the Jubilee also discuss our modern homelessness that results from, in the words of Ched Myers, the primary predicaments of our time, the destruction of our biosphere, the crushing burden of national and personal debts, the oppression of meaningless labor and the threat of unemployment, basic economic and social insecurity, and the spreading plague of consumerism. The Sabbath can thus be seen as a way to address such modern homelessness, as illustrated by this reflection by Lowry. As individual alienation increases and a sense of social solidarity declines, as the boundaries of time and place that once defined the world of work disappear into cyberspace, Sabbath speaks a word of proportion, limits, social solidarity, and the need for rest quiet reflection, and non-consumptive recreation. Similarly, the Kinslers wrote the following application to modern Christian faith and practice. This is not so much a matter of being religious on Sunday. In fact, the demands of church activities may make that day as phrenic as any other day. Rather, the Sabbath concern is to recall who we are and to recover our humanity so that we may continue to live in a the world without succumbing to the reigning ideology and mechanisms of production and consumption, so that we, we may live less in competition and more in community with those around us. The Sabbath Jubilee mandate for rest might lead us to consider the whole range of factors that are causing stressful lifestyles, various kinds of overconsumption and patterns of overwork, which can undermine our physical and emotional health our families, and our social life. Although the above quotes from Lowry and the Kinslers do not allude explicitly to environmental issues, they nevertheless mention environmental issues elsewhere. For example, the Kinslers suggest that modern Jubilee celebrations should include local, national, and global efforts to save the environment, stop global warming, protect endangered species, recycle resources, reduce waste, and redirect the world's economy for the well-being of our planet and all its inhabitants. Such efforts could help us overcome our homelessness. At the personal level in our families, we can take concrete steps to recover times and places to rest from the pressures and the pace of modern urban life, to gain perspective as to our real values, to practice Sabbath, to be human, to recover the life-giving and life-sharing meaning of home and household. Going home includes the possibility of helping others 
to recover their roots, their identity as human beings, to gain some semblance of security in a very insecure social, economic, spiritual order, and to build new possibilities for a sense of peace that is based not on material success or excess, but on more durable values and relationships. Thus, in a real sense, recovering our roots and identities as human beings requires us to look at homecoming, not only from our human perspective, but also from the perspective of all of Earth's inhabitants, including endangered species. It seems to me that this interpretation is not simply a projection of our modern concerns upon the Sabbath and Sabbath year laws of ancient Israel, but that the Kinslers have drawn insights not only from our modern predicament, but also from the ancient texts concerning Sabbath and the Sabbath year. <coughs> In other words, although our modern homelessness is more acute than the ancient Israelites, the ancient tradition contains messages that seek to overcome, at least partially, what homelessness due to environmental amnesia there was in ancient Israel. The Sabbath and the Sabbath year laws in Deuteronomy not only advocate remembering the exodus from Egypt, but require the entire household, including livestock, to rest, thereby providing the necessary, necessary time and space for reflection that would help to correct a two-dimensional, ahistorical, and instrumentalist view of nature. For example, the livestock are not simply beasts of burden for human exploitation, but subjects who deserve periods of rest and relaxation. Thus, to recover our identities as humans who are part of the Earth community, we must remember who we are including our close interconnections even to our livestock. Of course, the Sabbath and the Sabbath year laws in Deuteronomy nevertheless suffer from some amount of environmental amnesia, especially when the Sabbath year laws are compared to Leviticus, where the land also deserves rest. Nevertheless, the Sabbath and the Sabbath year laws appear to be ancient attempts to overcome to some degree the environmental amnesia of the time and place. And therefore, as suggested above in the quotes from the Kinslers, can serve as models for our own interpretation of Sabbath and Jubilee practices that may help us overcome our own homelessness. I want to close my formal comments tonight with a quote from Mark Beckoff, who I referred to earlier. He is a well-known, respected uh, field biologist whose work is focused primarily on canines and whose writing for more popular audiences is summarized well in his book, Animal Passions and Beastly Virtues. In this book, he makes the following challenge to his scientific colleagues. Holistic and more heart-driven science is needed. Science infused with spirit, compassion, and love. Closet holists need to emerge and offer their heretical views. Holistic heartfelt science reinforces a sense of togetherness and relationship, family and community and all. Here, Beckoff challenges so-called objective scientists to become compassionate advocates for all life by interacting with a broader group of collaborators, including everyone from scholars in the environmental humanities and arts to the non-human animals around us, both domestic and wild. I've had the opportunity to spend significant time with Mark, first when he came to ONU's campus for a week-long visit, and then later when he was one of the keynote speakers at a small interdisciplinary conference held by the European Forum for the Study of Religion and Environment. In some sense, his influence is evident throughout my work in environmental hermeneutics. Like Beckhoff, I want closet holists to emerge and offer their heretical views. But for many people of faith, that probably means paying more attention to the nitty-gritty parts of science. That is, instead of heart-driven science as our corrective, we probably need more head-driven faith. 
so that we can obtain an excellent balance of a heart and head driven faith with re reason. In this way, people of faith can share what Beckoff and others who have obtained a heart driven science, a sense of togetherness and relationship, family and community, and all as we become more aware of our interconnectedness with the rest of creation, whether this awareness comes first from our religious traditions or from our study of science. Thank you. I think the, the thing that informs it the most is I have a really good dog named Skillet. And uh, I didn't teach him any of this. Um, that, it's, it's certainly an issue. Uh, most of my friends who have chickens, they're not truly free range chickens. It's a lot easier to pasture chickens and keep them in a small protective fence. Um, an electric netting fence. But even that, the problem is, is the, the hawks can still come over the fence. So um, it, can, it can be a problem. Uh, and I, I have lost chickens to other predators. Uh, this year I actually lost all of my, uh, 70 of my cockerels, all the meat birds in one night. I suspect it was a mink. Uh, I came in and killed them all in, in one night. Um, and we have had mink come out of the ditch where the where the hawks nest <laughs> the same ditch so um, the, the bottom line is if, if you have a farm you're going to declare some animals and some plants good and some bad and you'll spend time encouraging the development of those that you decide are good and discouraging those that are bad um, there's no way around that I, I'm happy that Skillet has allowed me to have a friendlier relationship with birds of prey than a lot of, a lot of farmers. So, yes. <laughs> okay, that's a, that's a great question because I, I want to make clear that my comments here about urbanization does not mean that we can't do a much, much better job in urban areas down the road. And I think one of the things that we need to recognize if we're urban dwellers is this sharp dichotomy between nature and culture is something we have to end. We have to get rid of that mindset altogether. And, and then we have to look at somehow our urban spaces are also natural spaces. And, and how can they be, in one sense, more natural? Now that seems to be contradictory, admittedly. I want to say they are natural spaces. Well, they are, but they could be more natural. Because we define, we humans define what is nature, what is land, what is wilderness, what is, I mean, we, we do that. We construct these spaces. As soon as we say this is a nature preserve because we've drawn a line around it, we've constructed that as a nature preserve, right? And over here we've constructed this as a city, right? And this is wilderness where nature lives, and we live over here in the culture and there's no nature over here. Well, it, I mean, obviously it's never really been that way. Um, so I do think things like urban farming is, is, is an interesting, promising venture. There are also architects working on these kinds of problems in terms of how can you have 
structures, buildings that in one sense are more natural, that there's a much more inter interaction between humans in their daily lives, even in urban places. So that's a, that's a really important question, and I certainly don't want to, I don't know a whole lot about that, but I want to make sure that I'm not saying we all have to go back to the land and live on it. No, no, that, that's not going to happen. Um, but we can, we can all do it better wherever we are located. Yeah. And part of it is, is getting out of this mindset that there's a difference between culture, human culture over here and nature, and we're apart from nature. Yeah. Well, in the early part where I was talking about kind of introducing myself, um, growing up to a large degree, um, I learned a lot about the Bible sitting in the church camp outside. Okay, I think that I think that had something to do with my formation. Okay, now again, that's not that's not the kind of experience every kid is likely to get anytime soon. Um, so I mean, this idea of Wendell Berry reading the Bible outside. Yeah, I mean that was that was part of my my youth, my childhood and youth. Uh, so that would be that would be one thing that I yeah I think that's helpful. I this this whole idea of environmental amnesia applied to the ancient world is something that not many other people have talked about. So the, the the question you ask is a great question, but it's not like I've got a wealth of of scholarship to, to say this is what's going on. I, I agree with you that the, the level of environmental amnesia with many of us moderns is, is tremendous. I, I find it odd at times when people come to my farm and ask me, how do I know which, chi which eggs will become chickens and which eggs we can eat? They all will become chickens if you leave them there long enough, right? I, I mean, I, I, and and of course, I mean, some people think meat comes from the grocery store wrapped with you know, styrofoam and plastic over the top of it. I, I mean, so the the level obviously the ancients did not understand. I mean, even the urban elite were involved in slaughtering animals for sacrifice, if nothing else. They were much much closer to their meat than most of us are. Okay. But part of what I was doing is, is trying to think, where did, where did this bizarre way of thinking that we've got ourselves locked into start? And I, I think it really does start with urbanization in ancient Mesopotamia, which Israel is heavily influenced by. And then the biblical text is written by those urban elites. And so Western culture, yeah, we kind of have to claim that's part of our history, and that's where some of this is coming from. And, and, and just as the Bible is a patriarchal text, it's also uh, an anthropocentric text, and we need to understand that. But it's not as anthropocentric as a lot of our views, and so there's still a lot of good stuff in there that we can learn from it, as long as we're careful in how we read it. So that, that whole hermeneutic of suspicion that you find with various liberation theologies works really well with the biblical text on ecological yeah. It's a, again, it's a great question, and you're and you're causing me to stretch. You're causing me to stretch. Um, and and probably the best thing for me to do would be to 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 refer to people like Noreen Warnock. 
who works with local local matters here in the Columbus area. Used to live in Bluffton, about a block from my from my house when we lived in town. So um, there are lots of people doing really good work with that. There's a I forget the organization in, in Chicago that does really good work. Uh, it's an ecumenical group that has. Uh, good gardens and so forth, and works with local congregations. And there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on in urban areas. Um, and some of you probably know a lot of that better than I do. Certainly, school gardens, a lot of that stuff. But that's—I I mean, I don't know as much about that as as others. 